them. In fact, maybe Ron, you move up here and get those ladies move up the table. Okay. We Get Ron to come up here. You move up a table. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night, midweek, pit stop, Bible study, School of the Bible, Wilmer Beach Congregational Church. We are in uh, study of the book of Revelation, second pass to it, because there's a lot of uh, complicated, a lot of symbolism, a lot of uh, things to try to understand and discuss. So we've been taking a second pass after going through it once, first half of the year, and we're in chapter 10 tonight. So, um, Kathy, I'm going to get you to read chapter 9, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. A reminder about the sixth what the sixth angel and trumpet is addressed here in chapter 9. And then we're going to go into chapter 10 where there's uh, another pause again, like between uh, the um, seals and now the trumpets. Uh, we had that pause in um, chapter 7 with the 144,000 and the large multitude. Okay, so um, let's open with prayer, and then Kathy, I'll get you to read that. Mm -hmm. Reminder of what we finished last week. Okay, Heavenly Father, we thank you for a comfortable place to be tonight. We thank you for these that are here, others who might be away or traveling, anybody that's dealing with any illnesses. We ask your blessing upon all, and particularly we ask tonight that your spirit would enable us to uh, understand more fully uh, the passage that we're talking about. Uh, and uh, be able to uh, not only grow deeper in our knowledge, but more importantly, be strengthened in our faith. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so before we read that, um, just make some comments. I saw on, uh, I'm involved, the only, I don't do Facebook, I don't do Twitter. I am involved, active on LinkedIn, which is more of a professional social media thing. And I saw on there that uh, somebody was criticizing Prime Minister Netanyahu for something he said. You know, a lot of times political people make statements, and it's not uncommon that somebody has a difference of opinion. Well, anyway, the issue that uh, stirred up a response, Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of England, Israel, said that God has not always protected us. God has not always protected us. And there were some people that got after him about that. They were upset with that comment. They thought it was ignorant, they, whatever else. Um, so anyway, my response was, if God does not protect us, perhaps there's a reason why. If God does not protect us, perhaps there's a reason why. Now, can you think of situations in Israel ancient history or situation with uh, the Jews in particular where maybe uh, they would say, where was God? Why did God allow this? Where his chosen people? Where was God's protection for his chosen people? What's probably the number one, the number one thing where somebody might raise that Raise that as a question. They were enslaved in Egypt? Well, in history, the enslavement, yes, that's going back BC. Yes. Hitler, Hitler Holocaust. Five, six million Jews um, killed in the Holocaust. And that's a real issue for Jews is why did God allow this horrible thing to happen to us? which is a Jew that's also a Christian, born again, Christian, he, he talks about the Jewish people and how they, how they, of course they are God's chosen people, but they failed in a lot of ways. And um, so, you know, sometimes they're 
Well, that's one of the explanations that Orthodox Jews have come up with is that the Jews in Europe in the period before Hitler had assimilated very much so to where they had lost a lot of their identity and their faithfulness to the scriptures. Now there were a lot of Orthodox and especially in the country of Poland where some three million uh, Jews lived and many, many, many of them were of course victims of the Holocaust. So that's one explanation is that God withdrew his protection from them because they had compromised, they'd given in, they'd, they'd assimilated way too much, they'd lost, given up uh, the status that they should have had living under his law and being his people. But um, that's one thing that's, uh, that's, troubled, that's troubled Jews, is why did God allow this to happen? Yes? My question is, in the beginning of the Old Testament, you know, Speak up. but Jesus was born to save everybody. So, in the Jewish religion, they still don't believe that Christ, Christ is the Son of God. Or maybe that could be a reason. Many, many of the first Christians were people of Hebrew faith. Jesus was a Jew himself. Yes. The first 12 disciples were. Many early Christians were. But then, as we've seen as we've gone through these first church series, that uh, sometimes when Apostle Paul and others were going to synagogues and would share the message that Jesus Christ died on the cross, buried, rose again, was really the long awaited Messiah, there were those who responded in faith to that, and there were others that, that were very hostile to that. And, uh, you know, that's gone down through 2,000 years between the break of Christianity from Judaism that there are those that, uh, you mentioned this person that uh, is a Jewish Hebrew believer uh, in, in Yeshua and Jesus. Uh, so, yes. Another reason maybe why they've been so persecuted and so attacked is the devil hates... Um, you know, if he can mess up, like for instance, if he could have killed, uh, you know, he's always trying to interfere and end God's plans, which if he could have ended the line of Christ before Christ was born, he could have presumably prevented Christ well, from being born. So that's one, one of my points is that you can't understand anti-Semitism from purely just a human standpoint if you don't count into it Satan and demonic. Satan has hated the Hebrews, the Jewish people, who God revealed himself to as the one true God, gave the scriptures, through them came the Messiah. So you really can't understand, even today, the hatred of the Jews. If you don't understand that part of the component of all that is, is Satanism and, and demonic. But for the Holocaust, six million people, I mean, Hitler is obviously a demonically inspired person. And in that sense, uh, he kind of foreshadows, we've been talking about the Antichrist, uh, that kind of a figure. I mean, that he had the power of the sway over people. If you ever watched his uh, speeches, and I say, how did this guy get a stadium full of people, and people, you know, all the hell, hell, or all that. and you don't under, you can't understand that if you don't counter into it demonic influence and power. Yes. And the reason Satan would attack the Jews is because he hates God and he hates people of God. So therefore they're a target, just like all well, Christians. Do. And one thing is, is clear as we've gone through the book of Revelation is God is not through with the Jew. God is not through with the Jew. We saw that in the ceiling of the 144,000, what the Apostle Paul taught about the national turning. Uh, and that so uh, anyway um, I think that now you was absolutely correct when he said God has not always protected us but the question is why why and his point of course is uh, can't always count on God maybe we gotta we gotta 
do things ourselves. And that issue would be with the Iranians and the A-bomb and whatever else. Okay. But that's another whole matter. Um, Habakkuk, you remember the prophet Habakkuk? He understood that Judah, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom had been carried off into captivity by the Assyrians 150 years before that. But Judah, the southern kingdom, lasted another 150 years. And he understood that they, the people of God were far from God, whatever else. But he couldn't understand why God would use the Babylonians, who were a more wicked people, to punish the Israelites. This is in Habakkuk chapter 1. Until he went up to the tower and he got, yes, he got understanding. Okay, God said, understand, I'm going to use the Babylonians to deal with the Jews in Judea because they are far from God and whatever else. But I'm going to eventually deal with the Babylonians too. So sometimes God allows or God uses uh, people to do something. And we're going to see here in the book of Revelation, there were, in, in the tribulation, um, obviously there's things that God is allowing to happen to bring about judgments where he's not actually himself doing it, but he's allowing others to do, to do that, carry that out. So, last week we were on the uh, sixth trumpet. Chapter 9 had the fifth and the sixth trumpet. Before that, chapter 8 was the first four. So, uh, Kathy, refresh our memory and read for us chapter 9, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that was before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions. Out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads which they may inflict injury. The rest of the mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worship, worshiping demons and idols of gold, <coughs> silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see, hear, or walk, nor did they repent of their murderers, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So the, the first four trumpets in chapter 8, dealt with ecological uh, catastrophes. And then here in chapter 9, the fifth trumpet dealt with those locusts. We were talking about what kind of locusts were these locusts. Were they literal locusts? Were they some like supernatural locusts here or something? Is that term for something else? And then in the sixth trumpet, there's this large army large army, 200 million, that uh, eventually leads to the, the death of a third of the population of the earth. And at that time, if the population of the earth is 9 billion, that would be 3 billion people. Uh, so that's the fifth and the sixth trumpets, locusts, a large army, and the whole purpose of all of this is to get people to repent. But what does it say here at the end of the chapter you just read? They didn't repent. They didn't get the message. Or they refused to acknowledge or respond to, to, to the message. And what were they doing? It says that they continued to worship demons and idols, idols of gold, silver, and bronze, idols of wood, idols that cannot see, cannot hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magical arts, and their sexual immorality, and their threat, thefts. So, the people, all of this terrible thing, judgment, 
that God is allowing to come upon the people, get them to repent, it's not, it's, it doesn't, doesn't matter. They're not repenting. Okay. So we're going to take an interlude in chapter 10, a pause, like we saw between the seals, between the 6th and the 7th. And before we get to the uh, seventh trumpet, we're uh, in chapter 10. And in chapter 10, there's two main things that uh, we're going to see here. Um, chapter 10 has uh, a mighty angel that comes down from heaven. And also, you're going to see that... Uh, John is commanded to uh, continue to preach and proclaim the message. Uh, there's this little scroll. Some of the modern translations say books. Books did not exist at this time. The little scroll. Different from the scroll that we see back in chapter 5 that had the seven seals on it. This is a little scroll. What was on this little scroll? It's one thing we can talk about can also talk a little bit about who was this mighty angel and uh, we're going to look at the first uh, seven verses in particular to begin with. So let's start uh, over here with Lisa, go that way around, uh, the first seven verses. Announce the verse you're reading and then read your verse. And we're doing each one verse? Each one, each read one verse. Okay. So. Chapter 10 of Revelation. Verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet were like, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. Three. And he called out a loud voice that sounded like the roar of lions. After he had called out the seven trump, thunders answered with a roar. Number four. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. Five, and the mighty angel standing on the sea and on the land lifted his right hand to heaven. Six, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. Verse seven, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his set servants, the prophets. All right, let's just uh, go back here and look at this verse by verse. Talking about the angel, mighty angel, and the little scroll. The mighty angel. Uh, you got an idea, opinion, suspicion of who this mighty the angel might be Lisa of all the angels that you know that are pretty powerful and mighty Michael's mighty Michael is certainly one possibility Michael is mighty uh, there's a number of references to uh, Michael in uh, Daniel also in uh, Jude um, so he's not named but it could be Michael it's just mentioned that it's a, a mighty angel. So not just a, uh, an angel, angel, but this is kind of one of the uh, more powerful angels. Lisa and then Ron. I guess one thought I have, a couple thoughts. One is that often Michael, if he's doing something, he's named. So why would you name him sometimes and not, which of course it's still an option, but why would you name him most well, times? Maybe he's not named. And the other thing is, there's a lot of angels, right? A lot of Myriads angels. of angels, and so. But this is a mighty angel. Sure, sure. It sort of seems to indicate that that's just an ordinary angel. Right, but 
then Jesus made powers, principalities, and rulers in high places. So he created all, you know, stations or whatever of all things. So he could have created a so bunch of angel mighty, mighty angels. Down from heaven, yeah. so heaven. There's a mighty angel uh, given the powers of God to, to do what he's, he's doing here. Ron? Well, the way to say that, I, I could have believed that's possibly Jesus and his several, in addition to this verse and not skipping all over, but it sort of strengthened it in my mind that that's who it is because of the rainbow, number one, where he came from. And then um, later, it's back to the peak on earth and ocean. And, and to me, that's Christ. Christ is never called. He's certainly Christ's representative, this angel. Yes. He's acting as Christ's representative. Okay. Uh, some descriptive words are given here in the next couple of verses. Um, robed in a cloud, rainbow over his head, face shown like the sun, legs were like uh, fiery pillars, so some of that language sort of seems to be uh, similar to what John said, described about Jesus in chapter 1. So this angel, mighty angel, certainly a representative of, of Christ, uh, is, as he's viewing this, he's trying to, in earthly terms, describe what he's seeing. I tend to think this is the proclaiming angel we saw back in chapter 5 <clears throat> who said he's worthy to to open the scroll I think he is a representative of God probably a very mighty angel but I don't think it'd be Christ don't think it's Christ and, and probably not maybe even Michael but another one another one of the angels his specific purpose and we see it again later yeah. and, and you mentioned chapter 5 him. that angel yeah okay um, what we see next uh, is, is a description about him, this angel. Right foot in the sea, left foot on the land. Um, you remember the story uh, in ancient history in the island of Rhodes that created this colossus of Rhodes. There was this huge bronze statue. 40-some meters high or whatever else, that stood over the harbor. And the ships were a lot smaller then, so they could sail underneath. And how they, this was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was destroyed some years later, not that many years later, by an earthquake. And Rhodes is an island, the ninth largest island in the Mediterranean, but it's off the uh, southeast coast of Turkey. It's a Greek island. Uh, but Rhodes had this colossal image, and it was there to honor a victory they had had, um, that they were able to create this bronze metal statue that was 40-some meters high, one foot on one side of the harbor, one foot on the other side, and the ships could pass through it. You went into the harbor. Just an amazing thing. There's no archaeological evidence of this, but evidences that we know of about it is in history. But uh, there it was one foot on one side of the harbor, one foot on the other side. But here, and one foot is uh, in the water and one foot is on the land. What do you think that might be kind of uh, representative of? I think what he's about to say applies to the whole world. He's, he's basically the sea and the land. That's what there is. So, yeah. <clears throat> what's to follow is for the, the entirety of the earth, not just. And you see, the, it's authority over the land and over the sea, and it, they're planted with the feet, one in the sea, one in the land. Um, and he cries out, cries out, give a loud shower, shout like the. Roar of a lion, mighty beast of the jungle, uh, 
when the lion roars, uh, everybody within ear sight knows that uh, this powerful beast is uh, sounding out. Uh, then he shouted in, there's the voices of the seven thunders. We had a thunderstorm today in Milford. First of all, I heard lightning, then I heard some thunder. I saw lightning, you don't hear, you don't hear lightning, you see lightning, you hear thunder. And next thing you know is deluge. It really rained heavy for like 15, 20 minutes or something. Uh, but uh, kind of interesting that it says the voice of seven thunders. Uh, roar like a lion, voice of seven thunders. Again, now John's, as he's experiencing this, he's trying to describe what he's experiencing and he's using uh, earthly terms that would kind of help describe the effect that, that, that he's observing or experiencing. Seven thunders. Uh, when the seven thunders spoke, but he said he heard a voice from heaven. Uh, who read uh, verse 4? What did the voice from heaven say? When they had their voices, he was about to write. Seal up the seven and thunders. He said, he said, don't write what I'm saying. Now that's interesting. He says, told not to write down. And what's on, first of all, what's on this scroll? And uh, now he's told not to write this down, what he's experiencing. Meanwhile, he's written down a whole lot here in the book of Revelation. But what he's seen here, what's on his little scroll, he's told, don't write it down. But it's not his, not his decision. He's told not to write it down. So why do you think he's being told not, don't write this down, what, what you're hearing from these seven thunders. For some reason, God did not want this revealed. Not ready yet. A lot of other, a lot of other things have been revealed, uh, but don't reveal this. Um, and we got into where's the verse, verse about mystery. write that down, but I wrote down a number of things where... Seven is mystery. Verse seven. All right. I'll wait till I get to <clears> verse seven. <throat> so, verse five. The angel that I'd seen standing in the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. Can we go back just for a second? Yes. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons that obviously things are not mentioned without a purpose. Not mentioned for a purpose. So... The fact that there's seven peals of thunder or whatever means there's stuff's going to be happening between the sixth trumpet and the seventh. This is a three and a half year period. And if you look at the things that have happened so far, it sure doesn't seem to take three and a half years. Yet when the bowls start happening, that looks like it's going to be fairly quick and fairly catastrophic. So what's going on? going on in here, I think it just reveals there's still stuff to happen. But we're just not going to know until it happens. And for God, for whatever reason, did not want this to be revealed. Okay. Um, so here is the angel standing as he said, this is the third time, here again now in verse uh, 8, third time it's noted that the angel is standing with one foot in the sea and one foot in the land. Kind of interesting. Whenever the Bible says something once, it's important. It says something twice, okay, I, I got it now. Third time it's, it's stated um, to emphasize a point. That this angel there is, this, I think, He's in control of what's on the land and what's going on on the sea. Okay? Raises his hand, right hand, you know, often when you see somebody being sworn into office, they have to put one hand on the Bible or another hand, got to raise him, they make a vow, whatever. Okay? He's doing that. And he swore 
by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, and the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. What is that? Who is that a reference to? Who read that verse? Me. You. You read that. So what do you see? That's a reference to who? God. 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 That's what God does. Uh, he's created the heavens and uh, the earth and everything that's in it, etc. I was talking about the creation on Sunday and the importance of uh, acknowledging God the creator and if God is the creator and ultimately uh, as well the judge. And the Apostle Paul, when he's speaking to those uh, pagan philosophers, he's saying that something very basic to them is there's a creator and ultimately he's the judge and yes, uh, the one that's going to be the judge is the one that he raised from the dead. As he's talking there to the uh, Greek pagan Greek philosophers in Acts chapter 17. Uh, I like the uh, end of verse 6. There will be no more delay. There will be no more delay. Well, there is a pause here between the 6th and the 7th. Uh, so how do you how do you read that? I think I will wait no longer. That guy's not going to wait any longer? The things he has planned, the things that's under his authority and control and whatever, is going to happen. There will be no more delay. Uh, in the days the seventh angel was about to sound his trumpet, here's the word mystery. The mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants and the prophets. The mystery, a Greek word mysterium, it's not speaking about something that cannot be understood. A mystery, the Greek word mystery, mysterium, is something that is hidden until it's revealed. It's hidden until it's revealed. Now I'll give you some examples of things that in God's plan of things were hidden until he chose to reveal them. Uh, in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, the Apostle Paul talks about the conversion of the Jewish people here in the very end before the Lord returns. That's a mystery. Uh, to people down through the 2,000 years of the church, that there's this national turning. Uh, this said to occur, but it's a mystery how that would happen, when it would happen, but in God's time, it's going to take place. Uh, God's purpose for the church, the whole idea of the church, in Ephesians chapter uh, 3. Um, the church, which consists of Jew and Gentile, and of male and female, and east and west, and all that, uh, different from the makeup of the chosen people of the Old Testament, which were the Jews, the Hebrews. People could become Jews, but they had to become Jews. The church consists of Jew and Gentile. And uh, God's purpose for the church in Ephesians is spoken of as a mystery. And then that uh, there will be uh, bringing to a fulfillment uh, a, a fullness of all the Gentiles. In the same verse in Romans chapter 11 uh, that talked about the conversion of the Jews. Here there's this full number of Gentiles uh, that are being brought into the faith, uh, that's referred to as a mystery. The living presence, I like this, the living presence of Jesus in the believer. The living presence of Jesus by the Holy Spirit through faith in Colossians chapter 1 is referred to as a mystery as well. How that occurred. But for those of you that experienced it, you know that it's true. But uh, for those outside the faith and those well before that, uh, again, a mystery. A mystery that uh, was revealed and made known later in God's time. Now, the gospel itself in Colossians chapter 4 verse 3 is spoken of as a mystery. How the preaching of the cross, Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, the sins of the world, 
uh, his burial, his resurrection. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And how that can bring about uh, a changed life, salvation, uh, it is a mystery. But yet, it's uh, the power of God. And it's how God works. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. And those that uh, discount that, uh, they, they're missing out on what the whole power and purpose of the gospel in the church is. So those are some other uh, examples of the Greek word mystery. Um, again, it's not something that you watch some of these shows or read some of these books of mystery things and people are trying to understand something and it's like not being able to be understood. If it's not understood spiritually, it's because God hasn't yet chosen to reveal it. He will reveal it in his time. So this is said to be the mystery of God that will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, prophets of old, and uh, even here in the early uh, church, there were those that had the gift of, of prophecy. This, this could also be the mystery that Daniel wrote about back in Daniel 12. <clears throat> I can just read a couple of verses here. Yes. The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying it will be for a time, times, and half a time. Times, times, and half a time. Which the power of the holy people has been finally broken. All these things will be completed. I heard that I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. By the way, I think when we finish the second pass of Revelation, we need to go to another book. I think we're going to go to the book of Daniel. And in a sense, we might have done Daniel before, but I, I think it's uh, whether you go before or go after Revelation, you're going to see the connection between Daniel and Revelation. Uh, so, um, uh, Lord willing, we're still here. The Lord hasn't returned, which would be okay with me. Um, I think we'll be in the book of Daniel. The first half of Daniel, uh, very much uh, on a devotional point about a life that Daniel lived uh, in obedience to God. The second half of Daniel is much more about what we're talking here about end times. All that. Okay. Uh, we go on next to uh, chapter 8. So uh, we'll go around the room the other way. Yeah, verse 8. Verse 8. Verse 8. Excuse me. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Who read verse 8? Nobody yet. Peter, read verse 8 and then go around. Okay. Verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again, speaking with me and saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. Kathy? Nine. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will taste as sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll from the hands of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but it made my stomach sour. Verse 11. But when I had eaten it, and he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, continents. So, uh, verse 8, uh, as we begin this second section, John's command to preach and to prophesy uh, includes some uh, curious instructions. Some curious instructions. Um, he's told to go take this scroll book that lies open in the hand of the angel that's standing again, third time, it's mentioned now, uh, this little scroll that this mighty angel has, the angel that's standing with one foot in the sea and one foot in the land. 
Go and take the scroll that lies open. Okay? Understand that? Verse 9. Uh, angel. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And the angel says, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour. But in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. Now, I spent a good bit of the afternoon just thinking about this. Again, a couple months ago, we went over this. Um, did you ever eat something that your initial taste buds said, oh, this is good, but 15, 20 minutes later, your stomach's saying, this is not good. Whatever you just ate and swallowed, it might have tasted good, but it's not good down there now. Anybody ever had any experience like that? Yeah? My mother was always saying, I dare say eat this, I dare say eat that. She goes, she learned from experience as she'd gotten older that there were some things that uh, gave her uh, indigestion or whatever else. You know, and it might have been good to taste, but uh, as she got older, some other issues going on with uh, what's the uh, uh, the one little gland that has to, uh, that has to do with uh, gallbladder, gallbladder. Somebody's starting to have gallbladder problems. You know, the whole, the, our bodies are just amazing things. Uh, you ever think about you can eat something, you can chew it up, even if you don't chew it up that fine, you chew it up and it goes down the esophagus. Hopefully it goes down the esophagus, not the air pipe. That's not good. And it's in the stomach and then it goes to the uh, big in, little intestine, the big intestine, and it eventually goes out. Uh, the digestive juices of the stomach and the intestine doesn't eat up the stomach. But it causes the food you eat. Yeah, isn't that amazing that God created that? <laughs> it doesn't eat up our stomach, although sometimes you get that anti-acid, you know, uh, reflux or something like that. But generally speaking, that's how it works. But uh, you can taste something that's very sweet, but it may not set well with you. And that's the situation here with this scroll. So let's shift from eating and food to the scroll, what's the scroll, the word of God. This, is, this scroll contained the word of God and uh, something that uh, he was not supposed to uh, write about, reveal, uh, but there was something there about it that uh, initially there was some, some sweetness to it, but turned his stomach sour. Yes, Stephanie. So he was told not to write these things down that he heard. But the angel has a scroll. So would that scroll be the things that he was told not to write down? It was on whatever the angel had in his name? Seems to be. And then what's on that scroll? Um, was not to be revealed. But, um, what he, what he knew or understood of it is that uh, initially there was this sweetness, but then it, 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 as he ate it, you know, I heard that thing about what happened to your turn paper when my dog ate it. There about that couple that were getting, going to go to Europe to get married and the, the, dog, the dog ate the guy's passport. And then some members of Congress had to lean on it because trying to get a passport approved today in a couple even in a couple of months time you got you get a you, you got to be pretty lucky about but anyway this people's whole wedding and honeymoon was it because the dog ate the passport uh, <laughs> uh, and here he's being told to eat the scroll initially sweet but then uh, gonna turn the stomach sour uh, are there things in the Bible Anything that you've ever experienced where you initially say, oh, that's good. But the more you mull it, 
on it and you think about it and then you understand it and uh, maybe at the site like Mark Twain said it's not the things that he didn't understand that troubled him it's the things that he did understand so initially uh, the revelation of God can be uh, maybe a pleasant sweet thing there's a lot of verses I found a lot of verses today about uh, the word of God being sweet I didn't find any about the sour part yes well I took that you did found one. Good. You found one that I didn't find it. I found plenty about the, about the, uh, for instance, Psalm 119, 103, about the sweetness. If you go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. In chapter 3, verse it says, And he said to me, Son of man, eat what, you, eat what is before you eat this scroll, then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, eat the scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. And if you skip down to verse 14. This is chapter 3. Chapter 3. Verse 14, was it? Yeah, 14. Verse 14. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord upon me, because Israel did not listen to it. So the words were sweet as honey because they were the words from the Lord, but yet when they didn't listen to him, those words settled in his stomach almost like bitterness. Caused bitterness. All right. Took me away and I went in bitterness. And in the anger of my spirit. Um, anybody have a personal experience where there might have been something in the Bible that uh, you know it's God's word, God's revelation, got an initial blessing from, but uh, as time went by, a little period, period of time, you digested it, it caused you a little bit of uh, having a sour, maybe feeling convicted about something, or whatever else. The revelation of God, the judgment of God, is what I think I'm trying to point out here. Can can it happen? And I, I think this happens with people sometimes when they initially come into church, they hear the word, but they're in the fellowship of the church. It's a good experience. But then as they start to grasp the idea of that they're a sinner and that there's consequences of sin and there's judgment of sin, uh, people don't want to hear that. That's, that's not a, a, a sweet thing to them. That God's going to bless them, that's good. But uh, that God maybe judge them because of their sin, sin that they're not forgiven of, and hell, that's not that's, that's, that's good. And so there are people that get, get turned off by all that. In some ways, that's a problem that the modern church has. We want to preach love, which is great. God is love. But then people see it as only the good stuff. And they don't realize they have to repent. And sometimes when you have to repent, that's like when you get sick, you know you got to do something to get well. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you're feeling that, you know you have to repent. Yeah. And so that's certainly an analogy. That's the sort of analogy that I see from the sweetness and the sour that they say here about as he ate the scroll. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on this? Um, so this mighty angel, little scroll, what's the scroll contains? He's not supposed to write about, uh, has something to do with yet what's going to happen. They get forever. God's purposes didn't want revealed. Uh, but uh, John, as he experienced it, initially there was this sweetness, but then there was this sour thing. Um, Kind of interesting how he was told to eat the scroll. That's one way to get rid of it. It's before, you know, uh, Shredder. the shredders, you know. <laughs> just eat the scroll. Get rid of it, right? What's well, another another example, just like the one with Daniel before, how revelation to the church is like the prophets in the Old Testament. They're, these are both parallels. It's almost the same words in some cases. Ezekiel preached to Israel, Daniel to Israel, but now it's 
to the whole world. So the, the chapter ends with uh, this, uh, that he's told that he needs to go and prophesy again. I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So yet still what is going to happen? He's supposed to prophesy. What do you think that prophecy might have included? Maybe it's part of the seven things that he couldn't write down. What are you going to prophesy? What are you going to prophesy? The day, the day of the Lord. The upcoming final uh, woe, which is the seven bulls. Jonah was told to go and prophesy in Nineveh. We are told to go and share the gospel to all the nations. Prophesy Usually when we think of prophecy, we're thinking about something in the future, but most of the time the word prophecy just means to share a message from God to the people. Share a message to God, to the people, all the people, the many peoples, the nations, the languages, and the kings. People exist in nation groups. One of the things that distinguishes nation groups are the languages. I have, languages are a challenge to me. I have an issue with English, much less, uh, I took Spanish because they said that was easy. It wasn't easy for me. Maybe easier than uh, Latin or uh, German or Greek. I should have taken German. I knew some Pennsylvania Dutch, but it was low German. It didn't really count. But uh, one of the things that about nation and nation groups, people have languages. And it's just amazing, uh, Euro Europeans, they all know three, four, five languages. They grow up, grow, grow up. Uh, and it's a whole lot easier for children to learn a language. You think about it, you hear it, you hear something, and then you're able to speak those words with your, with your tongue. The whole thing of human speech is just an amazing thing. We got this issue right now with New York City, all these immigrant children. They don't speak English. They go to school. What to do with them? My suggestion is to put all of them in a class to learn English. Maybe you break the class down to grade one and two, three and four, five and six. In six months' time, they're speaking English. Children learn very quickly. Then you can put them in a class and then they can learn with the rest of the people. But try to put them in a class right now with everybody else, and, they don't, and the teacher's got to teach a subject, and these people don't know English. You've got to teach them English. Now, how hard is that? Put them in a class, teach them English. Six months to a year, they know English. Children pick it up very quickly. They go home and tell their parents, because the parents you know, don't pick it up in the nearest family. And then you can teach them, put them in the class at the age group they ought to be in. Okay. My, my two cents. training for my job and they want to teach kids that are bilingual they want them to um, even be trilingual they want them to be learning everything all the time <laughs> they got to learn English first. I know and they can do it very they do it very quickly yeah. children just amazing the whole thing of speech human speech you know when we talk about little babies what's the first thing you say da 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 always drives the mother's nuts must be something easier for a child to say "dada" -da, than "mama." <laughs> anyway, "dada." -da. What is the first thing he said? My son, when he was uh, 18 months or driving around, right, he sees the golden arches. Boom, 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 boom. He's starting to say McDonald's. <laughs> the whole thing in human speech is this. Anyway, nations and people exist as peoples, languages, and kings. Kings are people in authority, including including people in authority. So, John is told to go and prophesy. Can you imagine what was John thinking? He's told to go and prophesy. But he's 90-some years old in prison on a deserted island. Yeah. Well, one thing he did is he wrote it down here. And so he's, he's still prophesying 2,000 years later. You okay. can imagine his. Right, right. He's 90-some years old. 
Okay, so next week is chapter 11. So um, we only had 11 verses tonight, but next week is chapter 11, talking about the two witnesses. So we'll pick up there next week. Um, a good number of our folks are away. I mentioned Sunday, we had about 20 of our regulars were away, but thankfully we had the ladies. Kathy's ladies from the Bridgeport Rescue Mission. They had a great time. They had great a great time. Food. We had some a- wonderful food. And uh, I told the ladies, I said, you know, I have to tell you that everybody here is not quite as nice as Kathy. I'm just, <laughs> I was just kidding. I was just kidding. That was a big treat for them. They don't, they don't eat like that at Bridgeport Rescue. Just not. That was some excellent food. I mean, food. chicken, ribs, all kinds of Yeah, I, I definitely had some ribs. Yeah. Absolutely. We had ribs, we had hot dogs, hamburgers, we had all the other goodies, all the other goodies. Uh, it was a, we always have, every every Sunday, as you know, the coffee end is turning into lunch. I think it's been a very important part of our, of the church coming together and growing. Uh, so looking forward to this fall. As a, fall is a time of in-gathering. Time of in gathering, and uh, you know we're past, almost past summer. Got a few more days left of the summer. What's the, what's the last day of like September 21 or something like that? Uh, the end of summer, but uh, I think we're this week going to be past some of that real heat and humidity we we've, we've been having. Uh, I actually started some stuff in my greenhouse, the cold weather cold weather stuff. So. The, the heat will help it get germinated, but then it will be in my greenhouse growing come uh, once you get into the time of cold weather and frost and all that. So uh, I'm looking forward to the fall, the fall with the leaves changing. I'm glad to live somewhere where there's the seasons. I don't think I want to live somewhere it was 82 degrees and palm palm trees all the time and sand. It's nice to visit here, but I like, I like our seasons. And the, the fall is one of the best seasons in New England. And you get out and take a drive. When you get inland a little bit, this is this is metropolis of New York where we live. When you get inland, you get your classic Connecticut, and the drive up Route Eight when the leaves are changing. You think you're in New Hampshire, yeah. right? Uh, so hopefully, uh, our folks will be those who are traveling will be back Sunday. Uh, we've had some people that have had sickness or operations and things, praying for their recovery. And. Uh, just uh, looking forward to what God has in store for us this fall. Did you know that Condi passed? Yes, yes. And she put it on Facebook. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Matthew's on. And uh, he would like prayer for his instructor um, who's recovering from COVID. And also Matthew's recovering from um, a fever that he picked up in Connecticut when he was up here. A fever? Right. Thankfully, it doesn't seem to be near as deadly as uh, what it was two, three years ago. And I'd like to offer it for my co worker, um, uh, Christian, uh, he, he, if he's on, but even if he's not. <laughs> yeah. He's, a, he's a, a fine young man. Let's go some prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that we have to read and study tonight. We thank you that, uh, indeed, uh, your word, as we receive it, uh, there is a sweetness to us. But there's also uh, things in your word that uh, speak of judgment and whatever else that uh, can cause uh, uh, sour or bitter experiences for some, even as we maybe are concerned about the situation for others. <laughs> we... Uh, ask you to continue to bless our study. Uh, you promise in your word that anybody that reads and studies the book of Revelation will receive a blessing. So we thank you for that assurance. Uh, we do uh, pray for these that uh, lost their loved ones and uh, for those who are sick, those who have had operations, people who are traveling, uh, ask you to bring them back to us safely and in your time. heal him and um, we pray for Matt also with the fever pray for healing Um, I pray for my co-worker um, uh, Christian just blessings on him and his family Uh, I also want to pray for a young man um, Mike Mike up in Canada just for um, 
I would ask that you reveal yourself to him, Father, so he can come to know you and have a relationship with you. And uh, of course, we pray for all our leaders, Ken, Debbie, and of course our president and all of our leaders, Lord, um, you, as you tell us to. And we pray for the Jews also, for peace in Jerusalem, as you tell us to, God. Well, we continue to pray for these who have suffered uh, some horrible things that uh, took place in nature, Hawaii, southwest uh, from the uh, storm, southeast here with the hurricane, the earthquake in Morocco, the flooding in uh, Libya. Uh, it just seems to be more and more of this stuff, uh, possibly because indeed we are living in the last the end times, but it has a, an effect on people in uh, some very drastic ways. Uh, so uh, help us to uh, share and uh, rescue efforts to them, especially we ask your blessing upon the Ministry of Samaritan's Purse and, and any other groups that are there actually helping people and doing so, especially in the name of Jesus. And we pray this prayer tonight in the name of Jesus for the kingdom's sake. Amen.